Tony Turner. Tony Turner is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She went missing on December the 30th, 2019. Her purse, shoes, and a ceramic pot were found on the Homestead Grays Bridge. Inside of her purse was her cell phone, a water bottle, her diary, keys, and a wallet. Tony is still missing to this day. No one knows if she's alive or dead. They're assuming that because her belongings were found on a bridge that she may have jumped off of this bridge. Have they searched the waters in that area? And this is this person takes this story to a, a different uh, theme and they go into the differences between um, how some cases are handled and how other cases are handled. And they start talking about Gabby Petito and um, she just says this friend of hers deserves the same uproar and attention. It's been four years and she's still missing. There is a mural of her where she was last seen. That's the last thing we know of her. Please, please make Tony's life matter. Tony Marie Turner, been missing since December the 30th, 2019, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's a biracial female. Um, she was 22 at the time that she went missing, 5 foot 3 and 130 pounds. She's wearing a black zip-up jacket, a gray shirt with hable espanol in orange lettering on the back, with gray cargo pants and a black head wrap. She has black hair and brown eyes. Her nose and ears are pierced. And she has a piercing on her bottom lip. She has a tattoo of a spiral pattern on her left shoulder. At the time of her disappearance, she worked as a fabricator at Studebaker Metals in Braddock, Pennsylvania. She was a ceramics teacher at the Carnegie Library. Police read her diary and didn't see any entrances indicating anything suspicious, although she did write several posts about being in a kind of a sad mood. It's uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning, and her disappearance is considered suspicious. Tony Turner was her usual friendly self when she stopped by Dobra Tea in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh at around 6 p.m. on Monday, December the 30th, 2019. The 22-year-old then got on a city bus headed for Pittsburgh's Hazelwood neighborhood where she lived. The bus driver noted that she got off at her normal stop on Giddings Street. But what happened next is still a mystery. She never made it home and she was never seen again. Monday night, a Pittsburgh firefighter riding his bike on the Homestead Grays Bridge found a purse on the pedestrian walkway. Oddly, sitting next to the purse was a pair of shoes and a ceramic pot. Not seeing anyone on the bridge, the cyclist took the purse home with him. He checked the contents of the purse for anything that might identify the owner. He found a cell phone, keys, a water bottle, and a journal. The following morning, the man called one of the phone numbers he found on the cell phone and reached Tony's aunt. He explained what he had found and was trying to reunite the owner with her belongings. Um, he reached out, he made contact with the family and returned her items to her Tuesday. The firefighter told Tony's family that he had seen the pair of shoes and a ceramic vase, but he was unable to carry them on his bicycle, so he left them on the bridge. He assumed they were still there. Oddly, when family members went to retrieve these items, they were gone. It's unknown who removed them. Repeated public appeals for this person to come forward have gone unanswered. Since the items have never been recovered, no one can say for certain if they were actually Tony's or not. Well, maybe cleanup crews for the city or someone came along, saw these items, 
picked him up, threw them in the trash, or it could have just been a pedestrian. Tony's family members were confused, and Tony Marie Turner, age 22, her status is still missing. She disappeared after getting off of her usual bus stop near her home. Now, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm going to look on maps and see the Hazelwood community where she would have normally got off the bus and how far that would be from her neighborhood to this bridge. They said it wasn't an area where she normally would be. Did she get off the bus? Was she followed by somebody? Did she become somewhat spooked by this person following her? So she took a detour away from her home to lead them away so that they wouldn't know where she was going or could it some people believe she committed suicide by jumping off of this bridge but it looks like that you know by now they would have found her remains she worked her usual shift that day at the uh, metal shop and got off work at 4 p.m at 6 p.m she enjoyed some tea at a bohemian-style tea room on Merle Avenue in the Squirrel Hill South neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Her last contact with any of her family was with her sister. She spoke with her on the phone around the time she was at this shop. I don't know if the sister ever came out and said what her state of mind seemed to be during that phone call. Shortly after, Turner got on the bus, and she was last seen by the bus driver when she got off near her home at her normal stop. She never made it home, and she's never been heard from. And it goes on to talk about the man finding her items. Now, this was three miles from the bus stop. The day the man contacted her family to return her backpack with her belongings... Uh, her family said it was uncharacteristic of her to leave without warning. Police found no evidence of foul play, but the investigation into her case is ongoing and active. The circumstances around her disappearance remain unclear. Tony is an African-American white female born on June the 10th, 1997. She has black wavy hair, brown eyes. She's five foot three and weighs 130 pounds. And that's all there really is here. The investigating agency is the Pittsburgh Police Department, and their contact number is 412-323-7800. This next person is Jalisa Chantel Reynolds age 18. She's been missing from Scotland Neck, North Carolina since February the 22nd, 2010. Jaleesa, a young woman who was known to be very shy, was last seen at the Scotland Neck Memorial Library. She logged out of her computer at the library at around 11 a.m. and left the library. She was never seen again. It was discovered that around 1.40 that same day, she had logged into her account from the home of a convicted sex offender, Dwayne Davis. He didn't live too far from the library. Dwayne told police that Jaleesa left his home between the hours of 2 and 3. Davis is a sex offender who was convicted of rape in 1994. He served seven years in prison for this rape in 1994. He told police that Jaleesa visited his home frequently to use his computer and to see his horses, but he denies doing anything to her. It's been 13 years since Jaleesa went missing. Dwayne Davis has always been a suspect, but was never charged. What happened to Jaleesa? Um, I'm reading through the comments, and a lot of people think that he probably visited the library himself, had probably seen her there a few times using the computer, and it's possible that he may have offered her to come to his home to use the computer, 
um, he may have told her that he had a computer that he would give her or sell her cheap or, you know, something just to lure her to his house. Um, if she went there frequently, as he said, to use his computer, did the police check to see if she had logged in to her account more than just that one time? Did they search his property? Did they get a warrant and go, you know, through his computers and things to see what he might have been looking at online? I don't know the answers to that. Why would she go to his house to use his computers? If she was a visitor of the library, um, which has computers, he's lying. He knows exactly what happened to her. What has become of his home for the last 13 years since he still lived there? Um, someone else says maybe it was him that logged into her account, not her. It's possible. It's it's possible that he had done something to her before that, and she may have been carrying her password on. You know, some people. This was 2010, and if she was going to the library to use their computers, it's possible that she may have um, written her password down so she didn't forget it. But then again, did she have a cell phone? Were they able to try to track? her in that way. The police and everyone in that town damn well knows that he did something to her. I don't know why they did not go in there and find her. She was either alive when they, when they first started looking for her and he later killed her and disposed of her or he had already killed her by the time the police came to look for her. This is what someone on the Facebook comments is saying. And this is what I said. He probably had been watching her at the library. He may have spoken to her previously to get her trust and groomed her. She, he told the police that she liked to come to his home to look at his horses. Um, he's saying to the police, yeah, she's been here more than once. This is the reason I asked the question, did the police check his computer to see if she had logged in from it? I found another story about her that was dated October of 2012. Scotland Next Police Chief said that investigators planned to present the nearly three-year-old case of a missing teenager to the Halifax County District Attorney's Office. Chief Joe Williams did not say exactly when that might be, or who the suspects were in the disappearance of Jaleesa Reynolds. He did say that Reynolds' disappearance is classified as a missing person case, and they do believe foul play was involved. She was last seen using a public library, a public computer at the library, and they traced her internet activity to a home on Cemetery Road about two miles away. Since the disappearance, authorities have searched the area several times. They returned again this week with several search teams and archaeology students from East Carolina University. Williams said the latest search was not the result of any tips in the case. It's been very difficult for her family. Um, her mother said that she remains hopeful that her daughter will come home. Although police haven't commented on a possible suspect, in August of 2011, a search warrant was issued on the home of Dwayne Davis on Cemetery Road. Um, they identified him as a suspect in the case. Although the warrant does not name Reynolds, police have said at the time that there were no other girls missing in the area. She was a black female, age 18, 5 foot 2, and weighed around 220 pounds. Her last known description of clothing was a pink t-shirt, a blue denim jacket with a flower design on the back, tan paints, like khaki paints, black sneakers with Velcro straps, and she was wearing a black headscarf with bobby pins. She has black hair and brown eyes. A 
photo of Davis is posted with this case summary. Investigators have named him as a suspect in her disappearance, but he hasn't faced any charges. He denied having harmed her and said he didn't know what happened to her. What was his previous rape conviction? Was it a younger person like this, like Jaleesa? Was it a girl of that same age, range? Was it someone that he knew? Where did the rape take place? The reason I ask that is because it could be that he had a pattern. A Scotland Neck man, whom detectives are calling a suspect in a girl's disappearance, says that he's being harassed. The claim came two days after Dwayne Davis told investigators busted through the door of his home on Wednesday to carry out a search warrant. He said that they have received more than a dozen 911 calls from his address. A dozen 911 calls originating from or around his address. I don't know what that's about. Was he calling 911? Or were some other people going to his property and calling 911 to get the police to come out there? Search warrants were made available Thursday to indicate that cell phone calls from someone who appears to be trying to impersonate a female caller started in June of 2010 in the area around Dwayne Davis's home. Jaleesa Reynolds disappeared February the 22nd, 2010. These calls have originated after Mr. Davis became a suspect in the case again, um, in the case of this missing juvenile. So they think it's probably someone who's going out there, um, making these phone calls from his home or around his home. I don't know. It could have been him. I don't know why he would do that. The document doesn't name Reynolds, but police said Friday that there are no, no other girls missing in that area. All I know is I didn't have anything to do with harming this young lady, said Dwayne Davis. Just because of your record from the past doesn't make you the, the person that would hurt anybody. If you ask anybody about me, they know I'm a kind, warm-hearted person. He says he believes someone is playing on the phone to try to get authorities to come to his house. Well, who's got access to his house? In their latest search, authorities seized eight cell phones, which Davis says were out of service and old. He is upset and claims that investigators forced their way into his home before he could answer the door. And they had guns drawn on him and tried to make him lay down on the floor. I actually have pictures where they put handcuffs on me so tight that my arms turned red. A spokesman for Halifax County Sheriff's Office said that investigators carrying out the warrant acted appropriately. Reynolds' mother, Bernice Reynolds, did not want to talk about Davis, but said she would like for anyone to, out there to come forward if they have any information on the, her daughter. Davis said she was a nice young lady and I feel bad for her family. I had nothing to do with this, but everyone thinks that I did. And that's really all I could find on that. He maintains that Jaleesa visited his house frequently to use his computer. However, he denies harming her. Well, the question still looms that I have is, did the police check his devices? They seized his cell phones that he told them were old phones that didn't work. Did they find anything on those phones? And did they seize his laptop, computer, his desktop, whatever devices he had? Did they check his um, activities to see what types of uh, web pages he may have been visiting, anything illegal or anything that might indicate that he was maybe knew her, had they had conversations via text or messenger, why did she just all of a sudden just decide to go to this man's home? Um, 
I think it's possible that he had been hanging around the library. That's something that the library maybe would have been able to provide the police with any details about. But as of right now, Jaleesa remains a missing person, and that's all I can find on her story. I can't find anything updated. Reynolds was described as a shy teenager. She was outgoing online, but in person she was very reserved and quiet. She did not work at the time, and she was attending GED classes at the Halifax Community College. The investigating agency in this case is the Halifax County Sheriff's Office at 252-583-8201. Shamika Cozy vanished just a few days after Christmas, December the 30th, 2008, from Berkeley, Missouri. This time of year has been especially hard for her mother, Paula Hill. She has spent all these years without her daughter home for the holidays. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is releasing a new age progression of what Shamika may look like today at the age of 31. It was posted in December of 2023. On the night of Shamika's disappearance, her mother says her 16-year-old daughter was picked up at her home by her cousin. The two were planning to have a sleepover at the cousin's house. This was not an unusual occurrence. Shamika was family-oriented and had countless sleepovers with her cousin, who lived just one town away. Paula never imagined this would be the last time she would ever see her daughter. My niece said they stayed up until 1.30 in the morning watching movies, and then they went to bed. Shamika was sleeping on a couch in the living room. The next morning, Shamika's aunt woke up and noticed that she wasn't there. The, the door was unlocked. Shamika's purse and jacket were also missing, but her clothes and overnight bag were still inside the house. That's when she called me and asked me, did Shamika come home, said Paula Hill, her mother. I said, no, Shamika is not here. No one has seen or heard from her since that dreadful night. Paula strongly believes that even if Shamika voluntarily left the home, she intended to return. Shamika loved her family more than anything. She had a big sister and a little sister. My child would not leave and be gone like this without contacting her family. I cannot explain the feeling that our family has been going through, not knowing what happened to her or where she is. Paula says she is holding out hope to see her daughter again one day and she has never stopped searching. She will do anything in the world to find Shamika. I pray every day that you find a way home to your family, said her mother. I hope you see this and know that we have not stopped looking for you. If you have any information about Shamika Cozy, contact 1-800-THE-LOST, 1-800-843-5678, or the Berkeley, Missouri Police Department at one at one three one four five two four three three one one. I found a little bit more about Shamika online. She was an African American female. She was five foot two with brown hair and brown eyes. She was sixteen years old at the time that she disappeared, and she had short black hair. She weighed around one hundred and forty pounds. It's unknown what she was wearing. I don't know if there were other people at the house that night that maybe um, had any idea of what happened to her. Witnesses maybe saw other people in the house that night. Um, Shamika disappeared from Berkeley, Missouri around between 1.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. on December the 29th. 2008. This was in the 6,000 block of Napier. That night she left the house and came back inside several times. So apparently it sounds like maybe she was going outside to meet with somebody. Is it possible that she had arranged to have someone meet her? 
she was going outside to meet with this person and then just went out and didn't come back. Um, either foul play, even though the front door was unlocked and there was no indications of foul play, if she went outside and didn't return, um, authorities believe that she left on her own accord. Her mother also believes that she did leave voluntarily that night, but says that she does not believe she stayed gone this long voluntarily. She had left behind her belongings, and it looked as though she planned to return. It's possible that she had met with someone, and they left that area to go somewhere else, and something happened to her intentionally or unintentionally. That person should come forward, but they won't. I mean, we know that. Um, prior to her disappearance, her mother had caught her with a false ID card, and she told her that she had used the card to get into a local nightclub. Her mother thought she was smoking marijuana and she had once seen her getting into a dark colored car with a much older man. The police have not identified this man would like, but would like to interview him if they could. You would think that some of her friends from that time and maybe even her cousin would have spoken to her about this and who this man was. She would have mentioned him to someone, some of her friends. Years after she disappeared, her mother found a notebook that included written messages that her daughter had passed to a school friend, see what I said, a few months before she went missing. She had written about a boyfriend and told her friend that she thought she might be pregnant. The police interviewed the boyfriend, but he didn't provide much information. Shamika's friends didn't really provide much information either. Shamika could possibly still be in the area. She was known to frequent East St. Louis, Illinois. Her mother fears she may become a victim of sex trafficking, but there is little evidence of this, um, meaning that if she were on the streets, someone probably would have seen her. Some agency would have picked her up at some point. It's, there's two different, there's discrepancies on whether or not she went missing on the 29th or the 30th. If I had to give my own just thoughts on this, I would say more than likely she was meeting with a boyfriend or someone she had hoped to become involved with, probably someone older. She may have been pregnant and this person may have argued with her about this and it may have gotten out of hand and they've taken her and done something with her. I don't think she was a victim of sex trafficking and I don't think she's still out on the streets. I think that her remains are somewhere and I hate to give that prediction but if I had to guess that's what I would think. I will continue to read and see if there's any more information that comes out on her story. Thanks for watching.